we'll jump in. All right. And I'm recording. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Doug Zemeckis, a county agricultural agent with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Thanks for joining us to part two of a six-part seminar series we have this year, Weathering the Storm, Increased Resiliency a Decade After Superstorm Sandy, uh, being offered through Rutgers Cooperative Extension, a collaboration with two other ongoing long-term extension programs we have, Earth Day Every Day uh, webinar series and MEPS, the Marine Extension Program Seminar Series. I'm collaborating to bring you this series along with other county extension agents here at Rutgers. Um, excuse me, Dr. Steve Yurjo, Dr. Amy Rowe, Dr. Sal Mangiafico, and Michelle Bacchus. Uh, and hard to believe, but we are coming up in October here on the 10th anniversary since Superstorm Sandy. And we objective is to pause and reflect as well as evaluate on how New Jersey has become more resilient to environmental impacts since that major storm event back in 2012, uh, looking at our resiliency and response to storms and extreme weather. Last week, we had the first seminar, Dr. Dave Robinson from Rutgers University and the New Jersey State Climatologist give us an excellent presentation to kick off this series. The webinar is posted online already. Tonight, we have Dr. Tom Harrington uh, from Monmouth University as our second speaker. Some navigational aids for tonight's webinar. We're looking at approximately one hour, uh, maybe a bit longer, inclusive of presentation, questions, and answers. I'll be serving as the moderator tonight. If you have any questions for Tom, please type them into the chat. I mean, excuse me, not the chat, into the Q&A feature. Uh, I'll be organizing them and we'll get through as many questions that you put into the Q&A as we can on two breaks. We'll pause about halfway between and again at the end and I'll relay your questions uh, to Tom on those breaks. Uh, we are recording tonight and we will be sharing the recording and posting it uh, so you can watch it uh, as a follow-up as a second time. Uh, with that, Tom, can you uh, go to the next slide, please? Uh, at the end of this evening, during the Q&A period, there will also be an evaluation uh, questionnaire that will go up in the poll. Uh, Steve Yerjo uh, from our team will help orchestrate that. Uh, the objective is to better understand and evaluate the effectiveness of this educational webinar series to get your feedback on what you learned tonight, what you thought about the seminar, in order to uh, improve this and other program offerings through Rutgers Cooperative Extension. As we are recording, you can check out the recording if you want to read further. Uh, it's uh, optional if you want to volunteer to take part in the survey at the end to provide your input uh, in that evaluation form during the Q&A period. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. Also, we here through Rutgers Cooperative Extension are an equal opportunity program provider and employer providing uh, science-based information through our extension programs free of discrimination in order to serve clientele throughout New Jersey and beyond with science-based information. Uh, next slide, Tom. With that, I'd like to formally welcome our uh, invited speaker tonight, Dr. Tom Harrington. He's an associate director of the Urban Coast Institute with Monmouth University. He's also the New Jersey Sea Grant uh, Resilient Coastal Community Specialist. Uh, he did the trifecta at Stevens Institute of Technology, bachelor's, master's, and PhD in civil or ocean engineering. Uh, he's got over 30 years of experience in coastal resilience and hazard mitigation research uh, related to coastal system changes, uh, storm surge and wave impacts, uh, other areas such as natural based solutions for ec ecosystem rec restoration and community resilience. So a wide range of expertise and knowledge on this subject, a great speaker to have here tonight to talk about re uh, response and recovery from Superstorm Sandy. Tom, thanks for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Doug, Steve, Amy, and all the conveners of this uh, really great um, webinar series. Uh, I know that I'm gonna talk today with uh, the upcoming speakers, I know uh, quite a few of them and, and I'm gonna tune in and see what they have to say. So um, so I'm sure you got uh, Professor Robinson last week, if you attended the webinars, uh, provided you with a really great overview of Sandy and how Sandy formed and impact us. And tonight I'm gonna focus a little more on um, the impacts from the storm and what we learned from them. Um, what was our immediate response uh, right after the next day after Sandy and the first couple of weeks? 
Um, and then what was our longer term response once the Sandy Disaster Relief Act was um, uh, codified into law by Congress in 2013? And what kind of opportunities that opened for the region in terms of recovery? Uh, and then a little bit more deeper dive into what the state of New Jersey has been doing uh, both in the recovery and in the future planning for uh, what we're calling climate resilience. And so uh, hopefully that give you an idea of how far we've come and what we still need to do by the end of the talk um, since Sandy hit us in October 29th, 2012. So, um, like I said, I won't go too much into the storm, but uh, this is a satellite image of Sandy about 24 hours before landfall in New Jersey. And um, just wanted to show how much area of the Atlantic Ocean, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, Sandy took up uh, before landfall. And, and actually, uh, Fiona did the same thing this weekend as it went into the Canadian Maritimes. Uh, it actually expanded tremendously. So this is a characteristic of tropical systems in the fall, as they move north along the eastern seaboard, they seem to expand as they transition from tropical to subtropical or extratropical storm systems. Um, but just some things to note, uh, the wind field uh, to the north and east of the storm uh, covered about 300 miles of ocean surface. And uh, that's significant because that allowed two things to happen. One, very, very large waves to form um, these were gale force winds, 300 miles out from the center. Uh, and it also pushed a tremendous amount of water towards the coast. Uh, and that all translated with the motion of the storm as it moved towards New Jersey uh, over the 24 hours from this picture to landfall. And um, so what were those kind of uh, forcings that were occurring? So uh, the center of, or the eye of what was Sandy was actually downgraded to extra tropical by the time it made landfall, uh, crossed just north of Atlantic City on Brigantine Island. And if you can imagine the wind flow being counterclockwise, uh, those counterclockwise winds were pushing huge waves towards the coast, up to 40 feet high offshore, about 15 miles offshore of the coast, um, 30 feet high as you got within a couple of miles of the coast. And the also tremendous amount of storm surge, storm surges that we had never recorded before, at least over the last 100 years of, uh, 100 years plus of uh, observations of water levels along the coast. Uh, the water levels just to the south of the eye in Atlantic City reached about nine feet above mean lower low water, almost the record for the gauge. Uh, up in Sandy Hook, the it's hard to see here, but the water levels uh, exceeded what was no, what the National Weather Service designates as the major flood levels. Uh, and it was going up past 13 feet above mean lower low water when the gauge was destroyed out on Sandy Hook. Uh, I don't have it pictured here, but the tide gauge in lower Manhattan at the battery recorded 14 feet of water above mean lower low water. These greatly exceeded the prior maximum um, that had been observed. Uh, at, at the stations, especially in the New York Bight. They were anywhere from, at the time they made landfall, uh, the one in 700 year storm uh, or the one in one in 1500 year storm, uh, really dependent on where you were along the coast. But predominantly North Monmouth counties and Northern Ocean counties uh, got the brunt of the storm. Uh, they got the major surge levels as well as the biggest wave heights in New Jersey. And this is a, a picture, uh, I don't know who took this, but whoever did, this is an amazing photo. This is of the Ocean Grove Fishing Pier just to the south of Asbury Park in Monmouth County, uh, taken a couple hours before landfall. Uh, landfall occurred around 8 p.m.-ish, I think. Professor Robinson can correct me. Uh, but it was just right after sunset, right? It, it was dark when landfall occurred. Uh, so we really couldn't see the maximum, if you wanna consider that. Nobody has a picture of what was happening at the time of landfall. Uh, but here, just a couple hours before, the waves are just immense. Uh, the pier did not survive the storm. Uh, it was destroyed by these waves and the storm surge. Um, so uh, that wave and storm surge damage, um, almost <laughs> from 
uh, Monmouth County south through Ocean County uh, affected almost every structure on our open Atlantic coastline and bay shorelines. And this is um, uh, an image of the Seaside Heights area. So this is Seaside Heights, Ortley Beach, and Seaside Park. Um, this is the flood extent as uh, measured by uh, FEMA and the US uh, Geological Survey. Um, and so it shows you that the tremendous amount of flooding has occurred uh, along the barrier island spit here. And then this is an estimate of uh, the, the amount of damage, structural damage that occurred from aerial photographs that were taken immediately after the storm by both the US Army Corps of Engineers and the US Geological Survey. And FEMA used this, this, those photos to estimate initial damages from the storm. And so you can see any red dot represents a destroyed a home or a structure that had been destroyed. Uh, the oranges represent major damage, so almost destroyed. Uh, this kind of mustard color is minor damage, and then the paler colors are affected but not damaged. And so you can see almost every structure here, uh, except right along the shoreline south of Seaside Park uh, was damaged uh, during the storm. So the surge initially came from the ocean with the waves and the, the water that was pushed forward that you know, anywhere from eight, uh, I should say, sorry, uh, 12 to 13, 14 feet above mean lower low water. Uh, and then later, we'll talk about this, uh, a secondary surge came up the bays and flooded the islands from the back. So the type of oceanfront damage we saw um, were typical of direct wave attack on structures. So the beaches and dunes uh, where they were narrow and small allowed that surge in waves to reach the structures behind the beach. Uh, this type of damage is typical wave breaking right on the, the front walls and foundations of structures, uh, literally pushing right through them. Um, also scour was a big component, so wherever um, structures didn't have pile foundations or deep enough foundations. Uh, the amount of scour that occurred caused the structures to um, basically roll over and fail. Uh, so these were total, these would be red dots on that diagram I just showed you. Uh, along our bay shore, um, we had a little bit of delay. So I don't know if I have a picture here, but if you can imagine, I, I showed you the landfall picture and the wind field rotating counterclockwise as it came across the coastline of New Jersey. Well, our coastal bay is right behind our barrier islands uh, from Barnegat Bay south to Great Bay in Atlantic City. Um, the, those wind fields shifted from the northwest, which actually pushed water down the bay towards the south. So the water levels in the bay at landfall were quite low. Uh, they were almost negative one and a half feet below uh, mean lower low water in the bay. And over the next seven hours, as the storm moved inland, that wind field shifted to the south southwest and it pushed all that water right back up the bay. And so over seven hours from the time of landfall, uh, the water rose to almost um, seven feet above mean lower low water in the back bays. And then it took three days for it to drain back out. And so we had this prolonged flood event that was occurring in our bays that, that basically uh, anywhere from three to four feet of water inundated uh, the islands and, and the uh, barrier spits along the coast. And it's a tremendous damage. This isn't the same kind of damage. This is the damage of uh, water seeping into your, your drywall, into your insulation. Um, uh, and, and it's just devastating to homes because uh, once you get that kind of flooding, uh, black mold is soon to follow and, and significant interior damage to homes. Uh, this is a, a picture of Barnica Bay, I think just north of Route 72, looking south. You can see the waves being pushed by the southwesterly winds. Uh, and then this is a lagoonal development. And you can see the extensive flooding that's occurring uh, along these structures. And uh, so these were both um, just elevated water levels, but there was also a lot of higher velocity flows as the water moved in and out of these communities. Uh, so you had damage from uh, flowing water as well as standing water in the homes. 
Uh, we saw the same kind of impacts in the urban coast of New Jersey. So up in um, um, Hudson County, where, where Jersey City, Bayonne, Hoboken, Weehawken, uh, even uh, in Elizabeth and Kearney, uh, where we had um, just this huge surge of 14 feet above mean lower low water, uh, just inundate the low lying areas. These are all areas that have been filled as New York Harbor and the New York City region developed. Uh, here's all marshland. Uh, New Jersey Transit kept all their trains right in here. That's uh, one of their train servicing stations. They lost a lot of trains in the in the surge back in the marshes. Um, but the bulkheads here were never designed to prevent storm surge from occurring. Um, they were there to hold the fill in place. So they're very low. And so the surge just went right across them into the communities. Uh, and the other problem here was a lot of the infrastructure sits below grade. Uh, so the subway lines, the utility lines, the generators. So a tremendous amount of damage to the infrastructure of the transportation systems and power systems in the area. Uh, and this, these are pictures of what was happening in our urban coast. This is the path station in Hoboken. So this is water that's literally flowing down the elevator shaft into the subway tunnel uh, as the surge came across. Uh, this is the power outage that occurred in lower Manhattan because many of the substations are underground. Uh, that all of the tunnels flooded, the Battery Tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel, the Holland Tunnel, all had water in them. Uh, this is a picture of standing water in Hoboken two days later. So the water didn't really recede. So wherever it could find a low spot, it ponded and stayed there. And one of my favorite, these are the taxi cabs in Hoboken. They actually moved them from the waterfront uh, back to the west side of town because they thought they'd be safer, but actually that's a real low spot. And so they drowned in the floodwaters. So immediately after the storm, uh, I was at Stevens Institute of Technology at the time and um, my colleague, John Miller and I were able to get a, an NSF rapid grant to go out and take a look at damage uh, along the coast of New Jersey with other universities. There was a number of universities that had received these grants. Um, and we wanted to take a look at a stretch of shoreline. This is from Maniloking into Bayhead. This is Northern Ocean County. Point Pleasant is uh, to the north. Uh, and then also Seager was a, a town we looked at on the other side of um, uh, the Manasquan Inlet, which sits right up here. So uh, what we were interested in was what kind of damage uh, occurred and, and was there a, a pattern depending on where the structures were. And, uh, within these communities, we had uh, uh, an area of shoreline which was critically eroded uh, before Sandy made impact. So there was not much of a beach to protect the homes. Whereas in Seager, which I don't have pictured here, had a big federal beachville project to protect it. Um, so we looked at over 500 structures. We measured uh, water marks on the structures to see how high the water got. We looked at uh, damage. Uh, we tried to assess if it was um, uh, high velocity water flow or wave attack. Uh, we looked at scour. We looked at all the possible structural failure elements and, and um, began to catalog them. And what we learned um, in, this is Northern uh, Ocean County, so the Bayhead and Maniloking areas, uh, was that 50% um, you know, or so of the structures uh, survived quite well. They were in excellent condition. Um, about 30% were in good condition. Um, and then um, there was some disparity between Maniloking and Bayhead in that, uh, you know, somewhere around 16% were okay. They were probably not livable, but probably could be rebuilt. And then about 7% were either destroyed or about to fall down. Um, with Maniloking, what was interesting was that this destroyed number was twice as much as Bayhead. So we saw more structural damage in Maniloking than Bayhead. Uh, and then when we compare it to Seeger, which had the beach fill in front of it, uh, we saw one, no completely destroyed structures. Um, the, the most damage uh, conditions were maybe fair. So some damage due to water intrusion, but for the most part, um, you know, 90% of the homes we looked at were in really good conditions. You wouldn't have to worry about uh, not being able to move back into your home. Oops, wrong way. So what, what did we learn here? Well, uh, we learned from at least that little bit of 
comparison that natural features were extremely effective in mitigating damage due to wave and surge. Um, we also took a look at some other information that other universities are collecting. This is that Seaside Park area again that we looked at at the beginning. So this is the um, a damage assessment done by FEMA. You can see the destroyed homes here. This is the Ortley Beach section of um, the, this area of the coast. This is Seaside Heights and Seaside Park. And then down here is a little private community called Midway Beach. And so uh, what we did was we wanted to look at what the beach looked like before the storm made landfall. And so if we look at uh, the blue line represents Midway Beach and the red line Seaside Park. Uh, both were characterized by uh, beach berm elevations of about 10 feet high uh, above the geodetic datum. And uh, both had a pretty large dune, a uh, dune that was about 150 feet or more wide with crest elevations of 25 feet above um, the geodetic datum. So this is about 25 feet above mean sea level, roughly. And uh, then if we compare that to, this is Ortley Beach, which has a much narrower beach at a, a lower elevation, maybe around eight feet above uh, the geodetic datum, and a much narrower dune, not even 100 foot wide, with a crest elevation of about 17 feet. And so uh, this green line uh, is right here where all the red dots are. And so we can really see right away that um, the condition of the beach beforehand either protected communities or, or made them much more vulnerable. Um, these are, I should have mentioned these, all these profiles are from um, Stockton University's Coastal Research Center, which uh, monitors our shoreline um, uh, along our coast, and they've been doing it since 1984, so they have a really robust data set. But this is the pre-beach uh, profile in Ortley Beach before uh, Hurricane Sandy. The red line represents the post-storm survey that was conducted by Stockton, and you can see the entire beach and dune were wiped off the profile, and they were literally pushed into the community. And all of these homes uh, were impacted by the storm surge and waves, and you can see all the structures that have been pushed off their foundations and into other homes behind them, uh, just completely destroyed uh, maybe two, anywhere from five to six homes back from the, the shoreline. Uh, here is Seaside Park, and this is literally less than a mile south, and they had a much bigger dune uh, and beach, and uh, there was erosion, but you can see that the water never was able to get over the top of the dune or through the dune, and so there was no damage here to these structures uh, behind the beach. So natural systems worked and they worked even if they weren't natural. If we actually built them and engineered them, uh, they also worked. And so uh, this is an example of a beach fill project being constructed in, um, this is Harvey Cedars, I believe, Surf City in uh, Long Beach Island. So this is actually a, a pre-storm uh, photograph of Harvey Cedars, which had uh, received a federal beach fill project. This is the dune. You can see some of the dunes been planted with dune grasses and this part's being planted uh, probably actively in the photo. And this is the difference in the width of the beach. The, the uh, towns north and south did not uh, part participate in the, the beach fill project. And so uh, this would be an average condition of an unprotected or uh, area without a project. And I wanna just take a look at this, this little area right here behind the vegetated dune. And uh, this is post Sandy. The beach is much narrower, but if you can see the dune is still here, right? You can kind of see those grasses. There's a big scarp here, but the dune held. The, it was, the crest wasn't overtopped. And so uh, there's very, very little damage uh, to these community, these homes in this community. And so uh, when we look at the tire coast, so the Army Corps of Engineers in the state of New Jersey have been partnering since the uh, late 1980s to rebuild beaches for uh, coastal protection. And uh, this shows the red lines are everywhere where we, uh, the Army Corps and the state of New Jersey had constructed a beach to protect the communities behind it. And the yellow lines represent projects that were authorized but not constructed. So we just hadn't constructed them yet for a number of reasons, including private property rights issues that I'll talk about uh, later. Um, 
And then we had one area, this is Wildwood, New Jersey, that's under study. So <clears throat> we, if you look at the damage patterns versus where we had shore protection projects in place, it's quite striking. So here, Monmouth County and Ocean County, Northern Ocean County, remember, took the brunt of the storm surge. In Monmouth County, where we had the beach fill in place, we had um, over 300, 350 almost um, damaged structures that reached major category and 31 destroyed structures. Uh, but in Northern Ocean County, where we had no beach really, uh, we saw uh, over almost a thousand structures with major damage and 352 destroyed. Uh, and that's the difference between the shoreline protection that was provided especially when we look at destruction, because almost all of the de destroyed structures were along the ocean front. So they had direct wave attack. Uh, here's Harvey Cedars, two structures damaged at the major level uh, where we had no project. We saw more, not as much as we saw in Northern Ocean or Monmouth, but um, uh, 86 structures that were majorly damaged and eight that were destroyed. When we get into South Jersey, most of this damage is coming from flooding from the bay side. Uh, so it's a little bit different conditions. But uh, certainly uh, what we learned is that uh, restoring our natural systems, at least the beaches, protected the communities behind them. Uh, we also learned that if we build the structures appropriate, they survive as well. This is Long Beach Township. Again, this is a pre-storm profile uh, um, of the beach and dune, and it was also wiped off the, the profile during the storm, uh, but the structures behind this dune were built on pilings and uh, saw very little damage. Uh, so wherever we had uh, good construction codes and enforcement, we saw structures survive the storm. Uh, where we had poorly constructed buildings, this is uh, the trade winds in Monmouth County, uh, they were just built too low and the connections to their pilings, which are not really pilings, they're studs almost, uh, failed. And so the whole structure got rotated on itself, pushed over. Uh, we also saw that layered defense systems worked quite well. Uh, here in Bayhead, this is a picture of the beach in 2004, nice vegetated dune and beach. Um, and uh, this is a picture about an hour before landfall that was, that was taken showing uh, wave run up and impact on the structures uh, right behind the beach. Uh, and this is a post Sandy picture. Uh, and there was a, a seawall that had been built in the 1930s or even earlier, parts of it even earlier than that, uh, that protected these structures and it was underneath the dune. Uh, that's a picture of the seawall. Uh, and then just to the south of Bayhead and Maniloking, there was no uh, seawall underneath the dunes. And so here we saw tremendous wave damage and structural uh, home destruction. So what did not work? So what we learned from the surveys we had done was that um, the most significant damage could be correlated with small beaches and low dunes. Um, and almost all damage structures at the major or catastrophic level uh, were built prior to the National Flood Insurance Program and the building codes that they um, uh, require. And so many uh, slab on grade or peer supported or very small masonry foundation structures uh, were, were damaged to the point of destruction. Uh, our immediate response, uh, this is quite interesting. So at Maniloking, again, upper uh, Barnegat Bay, uh, this is a picture of the, the uh, bridge coming into Maniloking. Uh, during Hurricane Sandy, this area is breached. And, uh, so a new inlet was formed right here at the bridge. Uh, and it didn't stay there too long because uh, the state of New Jersey, FEMA, and the Army Corps of Engineers uh, uh, by November 1st, so landfall on October 29th, by November 1st, they had already had a task order to re rebuild this section of the beach. Uh, they actually, uh, five days later, um, had trucks there to start dumping sand and filling in the breach. And so this was very quickly um, uh, fixed. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons they did do that was because the this area of Ocean County is a, the major evacuation route is right along the shoreline on Route 35. 
so here again, this is where the breach occurs. You can see all the red dots here. Uh, all these the homes were destroyed as the water flowed right across the island. So one thing FEMA was doing um, prior to Sandy was they were remapping the floodplain. So they were about to come out with new um, base flood elevations for people to build homes to in the coastal zone of New Jersey. Uh, they hadn't come out yet with the maps. They were about a half a year to a year away. Uh, so they very quickly uh, after Sandy uh, put out what they called advisory base flood elevations, which were reflective of the new modeling and the new floodplain analysis they had done. Uh, so the people would build to these higher standards as um, they, they began to recover from Sandy. And so, uh, so many, almost I think they had to, almost every community adopted the advisory BFEs to guide the uh, redevelopment efforts of homeowners and the communities. Um, and so uh, a kind of unique outcome of that is that uh, some of these homes that were built in what were called hay zones where you don't have high velocity floodwaters or waves, all of a sudden found themselves in these much more vulnerable areas called B zones and they had to be elevated significantly. And so this is a picture of a home uh, being elevated, they're going to come in and dry pile underneath this home and then sit it back down. Uh, so a lot of homes were needed to be elevated, um, in some cases, five feet or higher. And, okay, I think I'll stop there. I think we're halfway through, Doug, are we? Yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're about halfway through. Actually, really good timing, especially with the introductions uh, well executed there. And you remember to stop on the break. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, a great overview, excellent visuals, and uh, I think we have people from throughout the state, so it's also useful that you've built in uh, examples and what occurred throughout our coastline here in New Jersey, and uh, your engineering expertise shines too, also talking about the different structures, which a uh, few people commented on. So uh, we had a good number of questions in the chat. I was able to answer a few of the easy ones, uh, but we have some good ones here lined up. Uh, one came in from Francis. She was wondering... What plans have been executed to prevent further breaching across Island Beach State Park, uh, three places that were breached during Sandy? So uh, Island Beach State Park is managed as a natural system. So not much has been done. They're using the natural features. They've uh, been restoring the dune fields, building up the dune fields to the best of their ability. Uh, there are some structures on the, on the bay side, but mainly to protect the few homes that are still out there, the governor's home. And um, so, uh, but, but no, they're, they're operating under, you know, nature can provide the resilience they need. And so, uh, so nothing's been done, but what, what they are benefiting from is a very large federal beachville project to the north of Island Beach State Park, was, which is actually providing significant amount of sediment into the system, which will help uh, uh, the park itself over the long term. Great, thanks, Tom. Inter useful comparisons there too. We have a natural uh, national park. Uh, Anne Marie had two questions. Uh, one, which I think you're gonna, you might want to just refer to your future slides. Do you work with Resilient NJ? And she was also wondering, can you define scour? <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, technical charge. Yes, we do work with Resilient NJ, and and I will talk about that program uh, in a little bit. Uh, scour is uh, caused by high, like if, uh, what's the word I want? To look? So if you stand <laughs> in the shoreline, if you ever walked into the swash zone and you stand there and the waves run up and down under your feet and you find yourself slowly sinking, it's the, the water flow around your feet actually moves sand. It accelerates the sand uh, around your feet and, and basically scours the sand underneath your feet away and you sink. So the same thing happens around buildings uh, and piling. So anytime there's water flowing at enough velocity to uh, mobilize the sediments around the structure, it'll create a hole and uh, allow that the structure will actually begin to fall into that hole. Hopefully that, ha that helps a little bit. <laughs> I hope so. So um, you touched upon this a bit more, but I know several people asked this frequently of our and our coastal stewardship as an example. Paul was wondering why was the decision made to close the inlet uh, that was formed there at the Manilocan Bridge? It could, 
He noted it could have been rebuilt better and solved a lot of the Northern Bay water quality problems, perhaps. Yeah, I, that was a, a topic that was discussed and debated after they uh, closed the breach. Um, and if they actually, there was a breach up in, um, I want to say Fire Island, I, I may not be right, but there was a breach uh, in, along the south shore of um, Long Island that was left open in a more natural area just for those reasons. And uh, but uh, in this case, in, in the Maniloking one, you had uh, two things. You had Route 35, which is a, a major uh, evacuation route for the region, as well as the bridge connecting uh, Maniloking to the mainland. And so um, the, the state and, and the Army Corps made the decision to, to close that as quickly as they could before you know, more damage was done to the coast. So uh, it would have probably improved water quality. Um, but um, I, th I think protecting the, the access routes was the goal there. Gotcha. <clears throat> Good question, Paul, and thanks, Tom. Uh, Barbara was wondering, did you study any of the buildup of the back bays south of the causeways as opposed to north, uh, talking about the bridge causeway connecting Long Beach Island to the mainland? We didn't, my work didn't focus uh, that far south. So we, again, we were one of many universities looking at different aspects. Uh, we were focusing on uh, comparison between protected and unprotected shorelines, really, that's what we were, we were thinking about. Um, so, but the, you know, the surge impacts were very similar, uh, no matter where you were uh, in the bay, because uh, the, uh, what basically happened was, the wind field from Sandy as it approached the coast kind of pushed all the bay water and all the water was running into the bays through the inlets to the south. Uh, and, and once it, the wind field turned to southwesterly, it, it, uh, it just came back as a long, like a tidal wave almost, like a siege. And um, so that crest propagated through all the communities south of, of uh, the upper bay. So those, those back bay damages were quite similar. Interesting. Uh, so Pat commented, uh, didn't notice any discussion yet about Raritan Bay, places like Union Beach, Kingsburg, Keyport, Aberdeen. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, knowledge of the, some of the response that's been done there or the, or the uh, occurrences during Sandy in Raritan Bay? Yeah, yeah, we, we do. I, I uh, have some, some stuff coming up about the, the impacts up there. Uh, certainly all of New York Harbor saw tremendous water levels um, and, and damage. Uh, Perth Amboy, for instance, was one of the most severely damaged areas. The highest surge in New Jersey was up in Perth Amboy. Um, so, so we did see tremendous flood damage there uh, in Woodbridge, um, along all the Raritan Bay shore. Um, not as much wave damage as, as flood damage. Uh, somewhat related, Anne-Marie had a, a good question I've heard in the past, does dredging, presumably of uh, in the estuaries uh, and bays, does that help mitigate flooding at all? Not of this type, no. The, the, the volume of water we're talking about is so high that it, the, the dredged volumes of the channels are, are minuscule compared to the volume of water moving in, so it really has no impact. Uh, Joe C. was wondering, uh, weren't gas, sewer, and fire hydrant lines also breached and affected during the flooding? Yes, yes. And so again, some of the immediate response was to restore power and gas lines. And uh, one of the things uh, for better, well, that we learned, I think, is that uh, taking a little more time to think about where you're going to replace those utilities would make sense because we really just put everything back exactly where it was before the storm, which means people are going to rebuild in exactly the same places. But the you know the the real focus of the governor's office and and the legislature at the time was to get people back in their homes as quickly as possible. And so if you remember the campaign was restore the shore stronger than a storm, and that was all. Uh, geared towards making sure people could rebuild and recover quickly. And that part of that was rebuilding the utilities uh, along the damaged areas. 
Thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, Francis was wondering who has the authority controlling the height of bulkheads in uh, existing footprints along Barnega Bay? Is that township or DEP, if you have any knowledge? They are local ordinances. Um, so um, there's a lot of challenges with that. Um, one is uh, not everybody is replacing their bulkheads at the same time. So uh, as they are replaced, they have to go to new, new heights depending on the local ordinance. Um, uh, but it's challenging to get to any unified kind of protection that way because you're always going to have low areas, uh, even as your neighbor replaces his bulkhead. If you don't do it at the same time, it, it, the vulnerability becomes your property. So, um, uh, but it is local. Good. Thanks, Tom. Uh, do three more and then uh, I'll organize and we'll get through some more at, at the end of the evening. Uh, Brooks commented now post Sandy, why do they still replenish beaches without first installing low bulkheads, shallow jetties, or large stone berms, then fill on top of these structures, um, pointing towards places like Brigantine, the Cove Beach replacement? Yeah, um, well, there's a lot of debate on structural. So there's, <laughs> it's pretty complex. That's a great question because there's a pretty complex answer. <laughs> There's two reasons. One is uh, there is some hesitance to put structures in uh, because if structures become exposed, then they they begin to accelerate erosion around them along the coastline. That's a well-known uh, problem we have with structures right on the coast. The other thing is that a lot of these projects were authorized for beach fill and nothing else. So, so in order to change the project design, uh, you almost have to go back to Congress and ask for uh, a revision to that design. And so at least along the ocean front, um, you know, that we're just working off the original design so that we don't need to go back to Congress for reauthorization. So uh, so it's kind of a policy side of the, the art, the problem. Interesting. Cool. Uh, thanks for that, Tom. Uh, one question from Claudia, she's wondering, how are efforts related to oyster reef building progressing uh, in order to help mitigate flooding and erosion? Pretty well. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in the second part of the talk too, but uh, we are seeing more and more projects being constructed uh, with oyster reefs uh, to stabilize uh, marsh shorelines or to stabilize uh, sandy bay shorelines. And uh, they're, they've been effective, so we're, we're learning as we go. Uh, we probably don't have the best designs figured out yet, but there's a lot of great work going on. Cool. Uh, a two-part question from Marty, and then we'll uh, move on. Uh, was there ever an assessment of the impact to towns with poor dunes or glorified berms, since it appeared a lot of damage was caused by these berms moving with wind and tides? So let me try and understand. So the, the question is the sand, the sand itself causing the damage or the? <laughs> An assessment of the impact of towns with poor dunes or glorified poor dunes. berms. Okay, I, yeah, I see. So the sand got overwashed into the, um, yeah, I, there was an overall assessment of uh, the region by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and uh, the conclusion, which I have in a few slides is, was that uh, wherever there was wide and high dune, high, wide beaches and high dunes, um, they were able to prevent damages. So, so the, the corollary there is yes, wherever there were, were, you know, lower beaches and dunes, that that became the surge pushed that sediment and the water, everything into the structures behind the, the beach. Uh, the follow up is: uh, Would you be able to comment on coastal towns without dunes? The practice of plowing sand ahead of storms to create <laughs> protective berms. Is that a good practice? Yeah. Um, no, not really. I, I, there, well, there's two reasons. So there are communities without dunes. So for instance, Monmouth County has a, a big beach fill project with the Army Corps of Engineers. However, it's not um, authorized as a storm damage reduction project. It's actually authorized as a, an erosion control project. And so the difference there is that it's just trying to keep sand in the system to provide protection to the, which is most of Monmouth County is a bluff. So it's trying to protect the bluff. Um, and there is a practice of communities uh, pushing sand up 
to, to prevent uh, surge coming across the beach. The problem with that is that piles of sand aren't as uh, cohesive as natural dunes, so they, they seem to erode much quicker than a natural dune would. So this, it, the, the protection is, is short-lived in that sense. And then um, moving sand, steepening the beach by moving sand up on it destabilizes the, the beach. So it tends to erode faster. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we de generally don't recommend it, but uh, you know, the, <laughs> there's a challenge there policy-wise again, if you if a town has done it for a long time and you, you suggest they don't do it and there is damage, then uh, the, some people just don't wanna get into that political fray. So, uh, so it, it's been a tradition in New Jersey for as long as I can remember. That was a good question. Thanks, Marty. I appreciate the response, Tom. Um, with that, how about we move on to the second uh, half of your talk here? Uh, sure. How about your work? It's been a lot, you probably read it all now, this, this Sandy Disaster Relief Appropriation Act. But it, in January of 2013, uh, this was the game changer. Congress uh, passed the Disaster Relief Appropriations Act, uh, which provided a um, tremendous amount of money for the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Housing and Urban Development, NOAA, uh, among other uh, federal agencies to begin to uh, respond to Sandy in a coordinated way. And so one of the things the supplemental funding uh, provided was money for the Corps to assess the effectiveness of all their projects uh, in preventing damages. And so as part of that, um, you know, we've seen a lot of numbers bounce around, but they estimated $50 billion in damages due to Sandy in the region. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they were looking across the entire region of impact. So not just here or New York City, but Maine to Florida. So they, they had a pretty broad uh, uh, test to do from Congress. Um, these are some of the numbers they've come up with based on what they learned and did in Sandy. Uh, you know, the kind of amazing things. This is just kind of the New York uh, division response. 15,000 trees down in New York City alone, uh, 200 generators installed, um, uh, 200 days of operation. So the uh, drift removal and sunken vessel removal was huge. Uh, so much damage in the harbor itself uh, that they had to take care of. But what I really wanna focus on here is uh, that within this analysis, they estimated that their projects had um, reduced damages by almost $2 billion. And so why was that? So this was kind of an interesting number that came out of their analysis. And um, what was interesting was when they looked at the beach fill projects, about $1.3 billion in avoided damages um, were created by those projects. And so again, they, they found the same uh, correlation between wide beaches and high dunes uh, that researchers in New Jersey found that they were very effective in preventing oceanfront damage. Uh, and then this was a, from one of their briefs, but uh, they, these are in the wrong place. They're looking between, this is a picture of Long Beach Island in Harvey Cedars, and this is Maniloking at the bridge. You can see the bridge back here. Uh, so really it's only about 30 miles between Maniloking and Long Beach Island, not this would be um, Seabright. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the damage was substantially different depending on where you were and what, what kind of natural protection you had in place. Uh, so the other thing the Sandy Disaster Relief Act did was it told the Corps that it can build every authorized but unconstructed project in the region. And so uh, we had pointed to these areas, here they are in red, the authorized but not constructed projects including some on the Raritan Bay, which I'll talk about. So uh, red are, uh, had been authorized. So this is actually Port Monmouth and this is uh, Union Beach. Um, and then there are some studies ongoing, uh, which are in the orange color. And so this, not only were they authorized to build these projects, but they were authorized to build them at 100% federal cost. And so typically these projects are split between federal funding, which is, covers about 65% of the cost and state funding, which covers 35%. So this was a, a 
a no brainer for the state of New Jersey, uh, but we had some issues to go through first. One being that there's a lot of prop private property ownership of the beaches, uh, especially in Northern Ocean County, especially here in Long Beach Island. Um, so one of the first things the governor had to do, well, I'll get to it in a second. Uh, so actually within the, the Sandy Relief Act, uh, there was $5 billion for the Corps to uh, do beach repairs. There was 19% of the, the total funds, uh, repair navigation structures and channels, uh, and then construct flood risk reduction projects. I see these are a huge percentage of the cost is in these flood risk reduction projects. Um, but uh, in order to, to rebuild the beaches, uh, the first thing the state had to do was obtain construction easements along the beach across private property. And this had been holding up a lot of the beach fill projects that had not been built. There was just an opposition to uh, providing or taking easements from private property owners. Uh, but uh, Governor um, Christie uh, made it his priority to build these beaches. And so he told the Attorney General's office uh, he would like the state to condemn these, e these properties. And it's not the entire property, actually it's a construction easement. And um, so they did. And this was a huge game changer because once the state uh, condemned the properties so that they could obtain the easements, it allowed the Corps to come in and build the projects. Uh, now, just because they condemned them doesn't mean they have to not pay the homeowners. So uh, there are still court cases ongoing to this day uh, trying to, to uh, come to a settlement on what the true value of those easements were uh, to the homeowners. Uh, but that opened the door for huge beach foot projects. This is Long Beach Island. I want to note there's three dredges in this picture. That's unheard of. We usually get one dredge per project. Uh, we had three dredges working on Long Beach Island uh, once this uh, ability to build the projects came in. Um, this is a picture of a beach being constructed. Uh, the dunes in place. So I think this is Monmouth County. Or uh, this is probably Long Beach Island as well because it had a dune. Uh, here's Atlantic City had the beach rebuilt. Uh, this is Surf City, the picture I showed before. Uh, and then there was also the money for those flood control projects. So one of them up on the Raritan Bay shore is Port Monmouth. Uh, this was a blended project. It had a small beach fill along the uh, Raritan Bay, and then it had flood walls along the marsh. This is um, Compton Creek and this is Hughes Creek. So they had a flood wall that was constructed. And then um, uh, this was actually a, a storm surge gate, a sector gate that was built to prevent storm surge from coming up the creek. And this flood wall tied into an existing levee in Keensburg. So it, it actually added protection to the east of Keensburg in Port Monmouth. This is that sector gate going in. Uh, it's all done now. It's a pretty cool structure to come look at. Um, but basically this keeps the channel open until there's a storm surge and then there's gates that come down straight down these uh, structures here that support the gate and it closes off the creek. And then this is a picture of the flood wall. The flood wall ties into the beach. And then this is what it looks like along the, the shoreline. So this is what your community would look like if it had a flood wall. Um, and the, the last thing the, the uh, Sandy Supplemental Bill did for the Corps was it told them to do a comprehensive analysis of the risks uh, of coastal damage uh, within the footprint from uh, basically uh, New Hampshire to Virginia. And so this is known as the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study or NACS, that's its acronym because the Corps has to have an acronym for everything. Um, and uh, this study uh, looked at many, many different options of possible projects. Uh, these are listing of those projects that they identified as uh, potential future projects to provide storm uh, damage reduction in the region. And uh, the study resulted in two follow-on studies. One was for the New York Harbor. This is known as the New Jersey New York Harbor tributary study. And then uh, the New Jersey Back Bay study, which looked at uh, some systematic way to protect properties along our coastal bays from future storm surges. And I'll talk about them uh, towards the end of the project. 
The other big uh, player in the recovery was uh, housing and urban development. HUD provided a tremendous amount of funds for homeowners and property owners to rebuild in the region. <laughs> you can see these uh, numbers are staggering. Um, you know, $10 billion, $10.5 billion total. Uh, and most of this is focused on low income housing. So it did have a, a real focus on trying to make sure low income housing occupants could get back in their homes. Uh, but the other thing HUD funded is what I consider to be the most important kind of lot, most important fundamental change in how we think about coastal resilience and protection uh, today. And that was a uh, competition known as Rebuild by Design. So they provided about a billion dollars uh, to do holistic community planning of projects to prevent storm damages. Um, and so uh, it was kicked off by Sean Donovan, who was the HUD uh, director at the time. And it was so different in its thought process. Uh, it started with asking for applications for anybody with an interest and skill set to work with teams on designing uh, resilience projects. Uh, so they took well all these uh, about 150 uh, applicants and put them on 10 teams. Uh, the 10 teams spent about three months working with the, the uh, program organizers uh, to go into communities, talk with communities, uh, talk with homeowners, see what their issues were, what they thought was most important to do. Uh, and then they went and created conceptual designs based on what they heard. Uh, they, they collectively created 41 concept designs. Uh, they presented those designs uh, and then HUD selected uh, one design per team. So 10 designs to move forward. And uh, then in 2014, they selected six of those to fund. And so the, the projects that came out of that were almost entirely focused on the use of natural features for resilience. And this was a real different way of thinking about resilience. And uh, so there's a project in lower Manhattan, you may read about it in the paper, still somewhat controversy, but using berms and levees to protect lower Manhattan uh, with a lot of natural infrastructure. Um, there's a flood, uh, basically a floodplain design for Bridgeport. Uh, Hoboken, I'll talk about this in, in more detail. This is actually in construction, but this is uh, what's designed to prevent water uh, from damaging homes in Hoboken. There's a living breakwaters project that's right now under construction off the southern southeast coast of Staten Island. So using natural features and breakwaters uh, to provide protection. So uh, really a thought changing way of looking at these issues. Uh, in Hoboken, uh, what happened was the water came into the town, the highest elevations in town are along the, the waterfront. And so once it got into uh, the town, all the water uh, pulled in the back. And so they came up with a strategy to uh, move that water into cisterns underground and then pump that water out when the storm surge decreases. And they have a series of levees uh, and flood wall structures that they want to put to prevent. So the water actually came in from the north and south. So these barriers will prevent that. Uh, this is an early design. I think the barriers have been moved back uh, into the town a little bit. Uh, but a lot of work's been done already. A lot of uh, open space has been uh, acquired and used as uh, flood um, collection points in the town. And um, there's some huge cisterns underneath these parks that collect the stormwater. And there's actually a canal in the back that's used to collect stormwater too. Um, uh, another big tool um, in, in the response was what New Jersey had available at, at its um, in the governor's office of recovery and rebuilding. And a lot of that went through the Department of Community Affairs. So they were working with communities to rebuild as, as best they could, uh, the DEP, and then coordination with FEMA was a big part of their work. Uh, one of the immediate things within, uh, by 2014, uh, these, this area of Manilogging south of Bayhead was still very vulnerable. And so one of the things the state did was uh, 
put in a sheet pile seawall uh, to protect the remaining homes as well as Route 35, which is right here. And so this seawall was placed with the understanding that the Army Corps was going to come in and build this beach once they got their contracts in place and put a dune, a big dune over the seawall and a beach in front of it. So this is uh, one of those hybrid structures uh, within a beach fill. Uh, the other big uh, effort was through the Blue Acres program. The Blue Acres program had been around since 1995, uh, had about $15 million to buy homeowners out of properties that would flood uh, if they wanted to. It's not, not a forced thing. But after FEMA, they were able to uh, get um, an, another $375 million to put into the Blue Acres program with the goal of purchasing 1,300 homes. Um, from willing sellers. And they were gonna buy the homes at their pre-storm value, which was very important, not the post-storm. So they were gonna get full market value for their house. Uh, and then the other uh, corollary or, or kind of focus was on making sure they would buy clusters of homes, not just one home on one block. So they were really trying to remove, um, you know, a block of homes at a time as a way to, to uh, prevent future damages. Uh, the last numbers I saw were in 2019, so it's a little bit dated, but at that time, it was over a thousand homes approved for purchase, uh, almost a thousand offers made, 700 offers accepted, and uh, 640 homes at that time had been demolished. And once the homes demolished, the land remains open space forever, um, so um, there can be no more damage on that property. Uh, one thing to really note here, although there was really tremendous success, all these homes are really along the bay shorelines and nothing was purchased on the open Atlantic coastline. And so we still have a total risk uh, of tremendous risk of real estate damage along the open coast. Uh, the other thing we learned in, in Sandy was that uh, not only were the beaches and dunes effective in preventing damage, but our wetlands were very effective in preventing damage. And uh, this was a, a study in scientific reports from 2017, where they modeled uh, sandy surge with and without marshes and found uh, that the marshes were really beneficial to the tune of $625 million in prevented damages. Uh, so one of the focuses areas of the state of New Jersey has been on restoring these natural coastal features to provide coastal resilience to communities and also uh, to the ecosystems um, of our coastal zone. And so they put out this uh, building ecological solutions to coastal community hazards uh, guideline, let's say 2015-ish, 16-ish. Uh, it was a collaborative process with many different groups. Um, here in Monmouth, we worked on uh, with the DEP to create a framework to prioritize where you may want to do these kind of adaptation projects. Uh, and that's been rolled into um, New Jersey's Coastal Ecological Restoration and Adaptation Plan, which is uh, uh, now part of um, the DEP's Resilient NJ program. Uh, uh, they took advantage of those guidelines that they had developed and started to implement projects uh, with NOAA funding primarily, uh, where they were using um, kind of hybrid structures. These are a blend of structural and living elements. So this is a living bulkhead design, uh, which uses gabion blocks and planet um, dune, dune grasses, uh, as well as just natural restoration. So here, there's been a lot of work done recently on trying to elevate marsh platforms to keep up with sea level rise. And this is a deposition project going on, moving material from the channels back onto the marsh platforms. Um, the other significant effort at the state has been in planning. And this is uh, a lot of the efforts uh, going along with Resilient NJ that was mentioned earlier by one of the participants. Uh, Resilient NJ got its start with HUD funding as part of the Sandy uh, Disaster Relief Act. Um, and they use that money to begin to do regional planning. So the objective of Resilient NJ was to not just look at one community, uh, but multiple communities at a time that share municipal boundaries. So how can we work collaboratively to solve some of these problems? Because Wooder doesn't really understand municipal boundaries and it's just as likely to flood you and your neighbor equally 
So, so we can't protect one community at a time. Uh, so the initial project, this was kind of a pilot for the program. Um, they worked with the two rivers area. This is the Shrewsbury and Navasink rivers in Monmouth County. Uh, they got as many communities as they could to partner on this project. It was led by Rutgers and um, the DEP. Um, and uh, I think at the time, Lewis Berger, but I, I think they had been purchased by the time the report was published. Um, uh, and this was kind of a model for future Resilient NJ. So they had a competition where they would fund four regions. And so the four regions that are currently funded or maybe had just completed their work uh, is uh, Hudson and Essex counties in uh, Northern New Jersey, Long Beach Island uh, in Ocean County, uh, Atlantic City, Brigantine and Pleasantville in um, Atlantic County. And then we have Woodbridge, um, South Amboy and Old Bridge, I believe in, in uh, along the Raritan Bay. And so these are uh, collaborative projects looking to create resi resilience plan for the region that can then be implemented through uh, funding. The other important thing that happened uh, in 2019, Governor Murphy issued Executive Order 89. This created a New Jersey Chief Resilience Officer for the first time ever, uh, established an interagency council on climate resilience, and created a climate and flood resilience program. And he tasked that program to do three things uh, develop a scientific report on climate change develop a climate change resilience strategy for New Jersey and provide technical assistance and guidance to municipalities to implement resilience projects or plan and implement. Uh, so now we had a, a framework to move forward and uh, by 2022, the DEP had issued their scientific report on climate change, which showed how uh, the sea levels have been changing, the temperature had been changing, rainfall patterns, and what we can expect in the future. And in 2021, they issued the climate change resilience strategy. Uh, the climate change resilience strategy covers all climate hazards, uh, but the one I'm interested in tonight is uh, priority six in the plan, which is the coastal resilience plan, uh, which has nine strategies for improving coastal resilience in New Jersey. And uh, if you look at these, it's quite interesting. So they they're, uh, want to incentivize community planning. So this is at the community level. Uh, they want to make sure they're using the best available science relative to sea level rise and other climate projections. Uh, they want to sustain and strengthen our natural features, tidal marshes. They want to use natural solutions, nature-based features and nature to stabilize the shoreline. They want to continue to do beach and dune uh, projects and maintenance to reduce erosion and storm damage. So these are all natural systems that we're looking at. Um, uh, and then there's uh, some elements of it that we wanna promote the elevation of infrastructure and structures. We wanna understand how we finance these things better. And then uh, lastly here, uh, incentivize the movement to save for areas. So this is uh, a tongue in cheek reference to retreat, but we do need to think about how we, we move away from the hazard at some point. Uh, and that's in this strategy. Uh, the, the other thing they did was they did create a local planning uh, for climate change toolkit. So there's a number of uh, different tools and guidance documents here on this webpage that walk communities through, you know, how they start a plan, how they uh, assess their vulnerabilities and risks, how they develop strategies to mitigate those risks, and then track what you're doing. So uh, this was a really good resource for communities. Um, they also established in 2016 the New Jersey Coastal Resilience Collaborative, which uh, it's basically a network of NGOs, academics, for-profits um, that all collaboratively work together to help uh, bring this information to the community level uh, so that people know what's available to them uh, and, and helps them walk through, in some cases, uh, different aspects of the planning process. Uh, the DEP is no longer um, directly in engaged here, but uh, there is a now I think it started with about 20 partners. There's now over 60 partners uh, and it still meets uh, twice a year to discuss these issues. Uh, the legislature uh, created the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center, which is a similar um, repository of information at Rutgers. Uh, this is looking at applied science and guidance that, that they can transfer to communities. 
Uh, so there's a lot of great resources here to help communities think about becoming more resilient. Uh, probably one of the most significant policy changes um, in 2021, the governor uh, signed into a, a law, a, uh, an amended um, municipal land use law. The municipal land use law is what um, requires communities to create master plans for their zoning and planning and building ordinances. Uh, and in 2021, they added the requirement to include climate change analysis in those plans. So now they have to include climate change and sea level rise and storm impacts in their master planning. Uh, there's also county planning that's been going on. Um, oh, I'm over time, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> uh, the county planning, uh, this is Monmouth County, worked with um, the Navy at Weapon Station Earl to do a comprehensive look at coastal resilience around the base. Uh, it was a community-driven process that identified over 50 potential resilience projects that would help communities and the base uh, be resilient to coastal storm damage. Uh, and then out of that came 11 projects that were high priorities. And so this is kind of their roadmap for um, what they would like to implement along the Bayshore. Uh, there's also some grassroots regional planning going on. Um, this is the New Jersey Bay Islands Initiative. This is in Barnegat Bay. There's many, many members of this group, including Monmouth, Stockton, Long Beach Township, Fish and Wildlife, uh, many. And one of the things they've done with a lot of help from the Nature Conservancy in Stockton is develop a Bay Island Restoration Planner, which prioritizes marsh areas that they would like to restore uh, in the Bay for community and uh, ecosystem resilience. Uh, and they've been successful. They were able to actually prepare a proposal and get funded from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to do preliminary designs for five of those islands. So, uh, so all of this planning builds the capacity to compete for external resources, right? So there's a lot of programs available with funding to help us uh, restore ecosystems for resilience. Um, National Fish and Wildlife, I mentioned, but the Department of Defense has a readiness program that provides funding for communities for resilience, um, restore America's estuary similarly, and now the Infrastructure Act has a ton of money to do restoration projects. And all of these have the same um, requirement, and that is planning and stakeholder engagement at the start, and then uh, it kind of walks you through site assessment and design and permitting and project implementation. Um, and then lastly, I'll, I'll say the, this is the back bay study. So in 2021, uh, the Army Corps I had mentioned was tasked with doing a focus study on New Jersey back bays. And they've come up with a tentatively selected plan that uses storm surge barriers at Manasquan Inlet, Barnegat Inlet, and Great Egg Inlet in Ocean City. Uh, it has some closure structures. This is, um, I believe, the Black Horse Pike in Atlantic City, and then uh, an old railway right away in Ocean City. Um, and then a lot of nature-based features uh, to provide resilience as well as um, home purchases and elevation of structures. Uh, this is a picture of what one of those storm surge barriers may look like across an inlet uh, and, and some of the nature-based features planning. So just to end real quickly, um, the question I think Doug asked me at the beginning is, are we better prepared today? And uh, well, we do know that oceanfront beach and dune systems provide significant storm surge protection. So we, we are better off along our oceanfront than we were before Sandy. Uh, home buyouts in low elevated areas and elevating homes in communities uh, certainly makes us more resilient. So we're better off there, but I would say not, there's many, many structures that really need to be elevated that have not been elevated yet. So, so this, kind of picture shows you, you know, one home being elevated, one on piles and one still at grade. And we see that a lot in our coastal communities. Um, so we're still exposed to some significant storm surge risk along our bay shores. Um, in terms of planning for the future, um, it has a position New Jersey well, the planning that's been going on uh, over the past five, six years, uh, will allow us to take advantage of the significant federal resources that are now becoming available uh, to communities. And the changes to the municipal land use policy will certainly make communities think about 
uh, their resilience in a much more thoughtful way. So all of these are making us uh, much more resilient to a future Sandy-like storm. Uh, but we're not there yet. I won't say we're there yet, uh, but we're well on our way. So uh, with that, I'll let you get back to your football game. I, oh, no, it didn't start yet. So <laughs> maybe I'm just on time. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. We uh, right around where we were kind of expecting with uh, covering this broad topic and uh, we're recording. So if anybody needs to uh, check out, get ready for the game or other things this evening, they can follow up in the recording. But Tom, thanks for a great talk on the uh, there the actions, initiatives, planning, uh, and your perspectives. That of course there's more to be done, but we're making good progress, setting the stage to become more resilient. Uh, as people are noticing there, Steve Urjo helped orchestrate the evaluation form. If you have some feedback on tonight, um, some input on what you learned, that'd be useful to help improve this and other programs. But while we're all together, Tom, I'm going to pitch some more uh, questions at you. Sure. Uh, maybe give another 10 minutes or so of Q&A uh, while we have your attention and have you still in the hot seat here this evening and let you get home from that office eventually. <laughs> uh, Paul asked earlier, uh, he observed, as you commented, uh, if rock walls and the steel sheeting underneath dunes provides more protection, why has that not been done more widely elsewhere? I think it will be in the future, um, especially as sea level continues to rise, because we will need some stronger protection uh, underneath the, the softer sand. Um, in the case of um, Maniloking, there was a pretty significant issue of jeopardizing the Beachville project, because if that wall were providing the protection that Beachville would have provided, then there was no longer a federal interest. Uh, so um, there were some really significant negotiations before that could even be done. So uh, I would say that's kind of a, an exception in terms of, I had mentioned before that these projects are designed um, and really can't be modified without Congress's approval. Uh, in this case, uh, they were able to work with the Corps to design the wall in a way that would still allow the project to move forward. So, but it's a good point. It, it's one that I know a lot of researchers are now focused on um, in the engineering community, and that's these, these hybrid structures or layered structures. Cool. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, at, earlier, when you were showing the work with two rivers, one future, Edward was, Edward was wondering, uh, for the LBI zone, Long Beach Island, why uh, is just the island included and the back bay is ignored in that effort? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Long Beach Island is, well, not unique. Many of our, our coastal communities, there's a number of different municipalities on one island. Uh, so it, in that case, I believe that you know, the, the people that pitched the proposal were looking at, you know, we can't just protect one little element of the island. We really need to work together to protect the entire island. And, and uh, yeah, the, the, the other side of the bay was, wasn't included. Um, I, I, don't, I can't answer why or why not that, that occurred, but, but certainly they met the, you know, the criteria in terms of being multiple municipalities adjacent to each other. Uh, somewhat related, Virginia was wondering, how is resilience done along the back bays? What are some of the uh, approaches that could be taken? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, it's always, um, the first thing is, that, that to me, we need to understand where the flooding is going to come from. So in the back bays, it's not necessarily wave damage as much as water entering uh, communities across bulkheads or through open streets. So I think, uh, you know, we really were to assess uh, community by community, you know, where is this water gonna get in and how can we stop it? That's the first thing. So there could be some bulkheads that need to be elevated. It could be, uh, there may be a, a bulkhead that needs to be replaced or built. So I think there's some structural elements can help. Uh, the other thing we learned uh, in Sandy is the importance of the marshes in dissipating the energy in the surge. And, and the little and the waves in the bay. Uh, and you know we know our marsh areas are are declining. you know I forget the number. I think seven percent of our total marsh areas has been lost since seventy seven, maybe large. I'm just I think that's the number I saw on that order. Uh, so 
if we keep losing marshes, we're going to be much more vulnerable. So we're trying to understand how those natural features can be restored or replaced or created as a way to um, provide resilience and then try to understand how much resilience that is. I think that's an open question in the research community. We're not 100% sure uh, how much protection that provides over the long term. And, and um, so there's still work to be done there. Thanks, Tom. Uh, another one, a good question came in from Francis, if you have any further thought, but when you showed the slides on the coastal resilience plan uh, from, I think it was 2021, uh, she was wondering, uh, noted at section, section six, reducing flood risk to existing buildings and infrastructure sounds great, but what are some of the ways to execute that in terms of increasing the, uh, reducing flood risk to existing buildings? Yeah, so there, uh, and it's a good question of how far the government can can ask people and communities to go, but th there is the, the elevation element of you know, making sure homes are at the base flood elevation or higher. A lot of communities actually after Sandy uh, required homeowners to build a foot above or higher above the base flood elevation. So the base flood elevation is what we would anticipate the water getting to in the 100 year storm event. That's FEMA's design criteria. Um, there's some people that think that's not enough on its own because we're gonna have sea level rise uh, occurring in the future. So maybe we should go even higher. So there, there is some recommendations on sea level rise projections to use when you think about community resilience and, and some of those ordinance about how high you should elevate your home. So I think it's, in that case, it's more guidance for communities to incorporate into their master planning and their ordinances, uh, and and less so about um, you know a way to to elevate every home. Although I think the Army Corps is thinking about that in some ways, but uh, at this point, it's it's really a, a guidance area for the strategy. Thank you, Tom. Um, an anonymous attendee I was asking about Shark River. Does the Army Corps of Engineers TSP plan, uh, does that include Shark River? It does include Shark River. Um, and I think it's mostly nature-based features, uh, but it does include a closure gate at the in entrance to the inlet. I know that, um, but it, it does it does have uh, project plans for Shark River. Cool, good to know. Uh, Got one more question now lined up, but uh, I might have missed some in the chat from earlier. If people are still here, you fit in another two or three, maybe if you throw them back into the chat and they get my attention. But uh, Tom, Christine was wondering, where are some of the examples of uh, specific communities that have taken advantage of the Blue Acres program? So Woodbridge Township is one that uh, has done a tremendous job of um, working with the homeowners in, in very low areas in the township and uh, creating a buyout package that um, you know was able to purchase you know city blocks at a time and uh, and what they've done is a lot of times when the buyouts complete it's just a vacant lot uh, but what Woodbridge has done is they put additional money into restoring the floodplain with its natural features so uh, in their case, not only did they buy the homes, but they um, were recreating uh, the, the marshlands and um, kind of the maritime uh, forest elements that used to be there. So that provides even more protection to the, the community in the future. So uh, that's one great example. Um, Sayreville had a number of homes bought out. Uh, so again, these are primarily Bayshore communities. Uh, Delaware Bayshore communities uh, similarly uh, had a number of homes bought out and restored to natural uh, landforms. So it was really uh, dependent. I think uh, on the slide, it was 16 municipalities and nine counties uh, that took advantage of the program. Interesting, great, great to know. And uh, I don't know if, but I was looking at the chat if you mentioned any, but Dennis is curious. Are there any measures in the works to protect New Jersey along the Delaware Bay? So the, yeah, the Delaware Bay, um, I would say in the in sense of yes, restoring as much of the natural systems as they can. So they're looking more to buffer. Uh, so there's very large expanses of marshland and uh, and uh, sandy shoreline along the Delaware Bay. 
and uh, primarily they've been looking to to kind of restore the sediment processes there to to rebuild beaches that uh, can form naturally and protect the marshes and then protect the communities behind them. So, uh, from at least at this point, it's it's primarily using nature as that buffer. Gotcha. Cool. Well. I'll throw one question at you, somewhat related. I guess we can't get through a whole night. Brooks put the question in, I think, for maybe the third time and uh, see if you have any input, especially as a background in ocean engineering. Uh, do you have any knowledge on whether or not uh, offshore wind turbines will be able to survive storms such as Sandy or other hurricanes? I, yes, I, I think they will. Uh, just knowing the ocean engineering processes and the firms that are out there, that uh, they would not design a structure that would fail in a hurricane. Uh, so, you know, the engineering is sound. I can say that these these are companies that have built huge offshore oil platforms. Some of them floating, some of them attached to the seabed. Uh, they have been designed to withstand hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, which are typically much stronger than here off the East Coast. So, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that. I you know if I were to worry about one thing about the offshore wind turbines is cable landings. I think they're much more vulnerable. Um, uh, you know, when you bring that cable on the shore and, and you route it underneath the islands, um, there's challenges there. There's tremendous challenges. And so I think that would be my concern more than the, the structures themselves. Sure. Great. Thank you very much for uh, your perspectives on that and everything else this evening, Tom. Appreciate you preparing an excellent presentation, delivering it very excellently as well, sharing your time here in the evening and your knowledge. Um, um, much appreciated by myself. A lot of great comments in the chat and uh, also looks like in the poll, much appreciated. So uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for joining this evening. Thank you for all the participants, the co-hosts, Steve, Amy, Sal, Michelle, for putting together the webinar this evening. Uh, the recording will be posted so you can follow up and uh, watch it a second time or catch anything you might have missed. Uh, the next seminar as part of this Weathering the Storm series will be on October 17th. Tanya Rohrbach from New Jersey Future will be speaking about uh, New Jersey's communities adapting to climate change. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this evening. Uh, the recording, I'll put the recording in if you're still with us. Um, from the first seminar, uh, like I did in the beginning, if you want to uh, catch that, but it's posted on YouTube, uh, you could follow up with myself or our co-organizers uh, or Tom, if you have any follow-up questions, yep. uh, we appreciate your interest and participation tonight, and hopefully we'll see you again in the coming weeks for more out of the six from this Weathering the Storm seminar series still to come. Thanks all. Be well. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate all your time this evening.